uh, developed a, uh, kind of at the heart of the leadership wise to develop this collaborative, uh, the uh, Health Product Declaration Collaborative, and they started to tap into kind of this missing spot in the, in the uh, life cycle assessment that leads to the uh, environmental product declarations, these uh, multi-attribute reporting systems that take kind of the whole building analysis into consideration, and there is that missing spot on the human health side that Brendan rightfully identified a while ago, and they decided, well, EPDs are starting to take off, life cycle assessments starting to take off, we really need some kind of system that's going to report on the human health side in particular. So they developed this open standard, it launched at Greenville about two years ago, and the uh, HPD now is something that's uh, being a, a incorporated into lead version four, and there are essentially seven basic <coughs> steps to uh, this open standard that develops this, this outcome. So uh, the first one is to really look at your materials, identify what's actually in it uh, at a very minute level, take a full inventory going well beyond material uh, safety data sheets and looking at especially things that relate to uh, risk for uh, to human health. Assess that health risk, uh, determine your, your compliance with regard to those exposure rates. Uh, there's some other accessory items related to that and then you summarize it in this open standard document and you eventually publish that. Uh, these are some of the big players that are involved with this. And uh, this is just uh, one of their templates that they provide on in terms of what it looks like. And uh, this is just one of their sample ones for insulation. And it maybe looks a little bit intimidating at first, but uh, it's a relatively short document and it'll give you a nice summary and, and helps you compare uh, apples to apples when it comes to material health. But it was still not really uh, enough for us. We're looking at these sorts of things and we're trying to work on lead projects and we're not chemists. We don't have a deep understanding of all these different terminologies. It was still rather confusing to us as a design team. Uh, working on a project at Earlham College over in Richmond, we were trying to uh, look at ways to incorporate these sorts of tools and actually we are signed up on some lead projects for some of the pilot credits for lead version 4 and we uh, figured out that there are some really nice tools out there that are helping you get beyond some of the um, alphabet soup, some of the chemistry, some of that technical nuance and helping uh, design teams, uh, architects, engineers, uh, even owners with uh, just kind of the basic concepts uh, with their understanding really be able to uh, get beyond it and start to understand uh, and kind of assess the relative risk of some of these materials. So the Sparrows tool that was developed by that, uh, by that group I talked about a few minutes ago, the Open Building Network, uh, this tool has two different databases in it. The first one being a uh, building products library that's ever growing and a uh, chemical and materials library. So they've kind of got, they kind of approach it from both sides. You can start off with a building material, look up something like a particular, like maybe a Knopf insulation. You know, Knopf has a manufacturing facility in Shelbyville, uh, it's something regional. Uh, they've got their eco spider with it. So, okay, let's look at them. It can give you this very simple uh, reporting tool to assess the relative uh, good or bad characteristics in different categories. And then they also, if you want to look at it from the other end and you want to assess particular chemicals, let's say you are able to pull that environmental product declaration that looks at your life cycle assessment, that you actually start to look under the hood at some of your products that you're wanting to use on a project and you're finding some of these chemicals that you can barely pronounce, let alone understand the health risks to them, uh, that you can use the Pharaoh's tool to uh, assess those. And what we found also was that uh, these products were, were, and chemicals were screened for various red list criteria. And we were hearing a lot of talk about this, so this gets back to the Google thing, that they were saying, okay, they require any materials that get used in any Google project has to have full participation in this tool. And they're citing these, uh, that red list criteria from uh, a couple of different organizations, and it gets really confusing because 
you know, I took a chemistry class in high school, but I surely didn't have one in architecture school. And uh, I read Cradle to Cradle, uh, as suggested a while ago, a great, great book, talked to me about endocrine disruptors and all this sort of stuff. But, um, and I can understand building science, but the chemistry side of things for me, you give me a chemical equation, uh, it's, it's rather confusing. Uh, so this red, this red list criterion was uh, something that we had to dig into a little bit deeper. So here's a screenshot from the Pharaohs database, because we were using it on that, uh, a couple of those projects. And you can see how they make this thing very simple for design teams. That they give you a few very basic categories. They talk about VOC levels. They talk about toxicity in the construction process. So not just how bad is it once it's installed, but how bad is it for the people uh, during the construction and manufacturing uh, <laughs> renewable materials, uh, as well as if renewable energy was used to develop this product. And you can look at this and see on a 1 to 10 scale how well a product does because uh, you go to a manufacturer's website and everybody's green and eco, this and that now. It becomes uh, very difficult to cut through the fodder and really understand uh, the, the true uh, success with regard to the green attributes for uh, products, especially in a holistic sense. So Google, some other big... Uh, institutions and corporations are uh, keying into this human health side, and this becomes a very convenient vehicle to tap into that, but there's still all these competing red lists, and Pharos will actually let you filter different materials. So you say, I want to look at um, wood cabinetry, I want to look at uh, paints, I want to look at bad insulation, and you can actually filter it in terms of these different red lists. Uh, these Red lists, though, were still kind of confusing to us. So we wanted to look at those and start to unpack that a little bit. And this, it really started to feel like at this point, like uh, Morpheus on, on the Matrix. It's like we, we, we took the pill and we're seeing how deep the rabbit hole goes because here we were just wanting to look at how do we attract a client like Google to this development so we can give them a, or just any big tech industry, give them a big corporate um, headquarters in this part of the country. And what we find is, okay, they're focusing on human health. Okay, they're saying that you have to get into the Sparrows program. Okay, and that's telling us that you have to screen out different red lists. Okay, and we keep going deeper and deeper, and more and more alphabet soup. So we end up coming up with, uh, this is a great diagram uh, by Tom Lint, again, from the Healthy Building Network, uh, the folks who helped develop that Green Guide for Healthcare uh, back in the day, 10 years ago now. Uh, which later became, as I said, uh, kind of the, the origins of the Leap for Healthcare. But uh, you can see this very confusing looking diagram that starts to overlay all these different red lists. And it's, it, was a, it was great for us to help us with uh, kind of our own general orientation. You can see the, the different spheres that each of these red lists start to capture. And so we'll. we'll briefly touch on each of these, and you can see uh, just kind of how, what, what the basis is for each of these and uh, the spheres that they capture. The first one here being Perkins and Will. Well, is that a red list? Uh, I know that's a big architecture firm, so uh, what's that about? And you can see that's a pretty big sphere that it's capturing, and it's overlapping with a lot of these other acronyms that probably don't mean a whole heck of a lot to a lot of you right now, but hopefully we'll hear in a few minutes. So. Perkins and Will, they develop the, they have a, a research arm. Some of the big architecture firms in the country have a, a research arm. And they uh, developed this database of different chemicals, different products uh, that have um, perhaps a, a risk to human health. And their list cover asthma triggers and uh, different types of flame retardants, and uh, what they did is they kind of subscribed to the precautionary principle as the basis for developing their red list. So we were expecting to see something like maybe the EPA or some kind of um, maybe an ANSI standard or, or something. Uh, they were talking about this precautionary principle as their, the basis for their precautionary list, as the name kind of uh, suggests there. So we had to dig a little deeper into that one, figure out what that was about. The precautionary principle, 
Uh, the origin of that comes from the Science and Environmental Health Network, which was founded 20 years ago now, back in 1994, uh, a consortium of different environmental organizations. And they were, at the time, concerned about the misuse of science and the failure to protect the environment and human health. And they got a nonprofit status a few years later, and they were a leading proponent of this precautionary principle, which is uh, basically states that if there's, a, if there's a threat level, uh, through an analysis, the looking at the chemistry of products, if it looks like there could be a, I'm kind of paraphrasing here, but there could be a threat level to it, then it's best to take uh, a precautionary approach to it, uh, even if that relationship isn't fully understood. And that's, uh, that notion about this precautionary approach to possible risks uh, kind of aggravates some uh, big players in the chemical industry who say that, okay, yeah, our products have some bad stuff in it. Like, like PVC, for instance, might have some bad stuff in it, but by the time you get it, the, the, the exposure risk has been reduced. Well, the precautionary uh, principle here would suggest that, uh, and since it's not fully understood at this point in time, it's best to be uh, cautious and try to find viable alternatives if those exist. And that was really the basis for them covering uh, quite a large 